The NCAA's first major legal battle since the O'Bannon case is finally over. The Supreme Court came to a decision and it doesn't look good on its face for the NCAA. But just as everything in the legal system, it's a lot more complicated than just winners and losers. So let's discuss the entire decision for NCAA v. Alston. If you've been following the channel for a while, then you'll know that we've done a whole lot concerning the NCAA's legal status, this particular legal battle. We did a video covering the entire oral arguments when they became public. I think that was a few months ago now. Uh, some really interesting stuff. And I said at the time that it certainly seemed as though the NCAA was either trying to get off on sort of a sort of a technicality almost they're trying to go for more of a procedural look at their specific antitrust issue that seems to be what the court ended up actually going with so the core issue here for the NCAA was actually based around academic payments so the NCAA would limit any academic related payment that an athlete could athlete could receive to the cost of attendance so uh, schools were not allowed to pay for vocational school scholarships. They were not allowed to give paid internships to students, uh, to student athletes. So basically, whatever it costed you to attend the school, that's what the NCAA was allowed to pay. Uh, and then they added on some uh, extra food vouchers and things like that they were allowed to give. And then they added on an almost $6,000 payment for athletic excellence. But that's it. That's all athletes were allowed to get. And so this group of athletes, led by Sean Alston, a former West Virginia football player, challenged this in court. It went up from district court to appellate uh, appeals court to now the Supreme Court. And at each level, the court ruled that the NCAA was in violation of the Sherman Act. So the anti the major antitrust law in the United States. So this is where I think it's actually most interesting, this issue. So the Sherman Act is a, a notoriously difficult piece of legislation uh, to actually litigate and, and, and figure out in court because there are so many rules and there's such an argument over definitions that it makes it very hard to even come up with an argument. So what I mean by that is the Sherman Act has certain rules for what happens if a business constitutes a monopoly in a certain market. But so much of the uh, of the discussion when, when it comes to cases about the Sherman Act come about the market that they're actually in. So I think I gave this example on our video talking about the oral arguments. Is the NFL in the market of professional football? Is it in the market of football? Is it in the market of sports? Or is it in the broader market of entertainment? And where you see them in violation of the Sherman Act depends completely on what market you think they're in. And the NCAA was basically in the same boat when it comes to this. Uh, so basically what the NCAA was asking the Supreme Court to do is just to overrule the district and appellate courts by basically saying the NCAA is essentially a conglomeration of its member schools. Its member schools don't, they're not, uh, they're not, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember the exact uh, the exact words that that the NCAA tried to use commercial institutions the, mem the member schools are not commercial institutions so because of that the NCAA couldn't constitute a monopoly and so therefore we can't be held in violation of the Sherman Act for limiting academic payments to students so that is the claim that the Supreme Court that both that the district and appellate courts ruled against the NCAA and the Supreme Court affirmed that. So the Supreme Court basically said, look, th and this is actually really interesting. The Supreme Court basically said, first of all, doesn't matter whether the schools are commercial institutions or not, because, and this is something that uh, Justice Gorsuch uh, pointed out when he was writing the opinion of the court, he said the NCAA has argued to the contrary in previous cases where they've essentially argued their schools are commercial institutions. So whether you say they are or not, it doesn't matter. The more important thing, though, is the NCAA basically, they basically said uh, that the NCAA, whether courts rule that it's a conglomerate of schools or that it's 
its own private entity because the NCAA was arguing we're just we're just this collective of schools, right? So you can't there there's nothing there's nothing that we can do because we're not the business. So the Supreme Court said, "No, you are the business. Whether or not you're a collective of schools, the NCAA is the business. You make the rules." So therefore, whatever whatever you want to define yourself as, the NCAA has monopoly power in its industry, which was successfully defined by uh, the by Alston as college sports. And if that's the industry, it's pretty obvious the NCAA has monopoly power in collegiate sports. So the Supreme Court said whatever, and, and, and not only did they say in this narrow circumstance, you are not, you have monopoly power. They said in all circumstances, whatever you try to define yourself as, whether you say schools are commercial institutions or whether they're, uh, whether they're academic institutions, whether you say that you are a private business or that you're a conglomerate of businesses or even if you say you're a conglomerate of non-private businesses because the majority of NCAA member schools are public institutions whatever you call yourself you have monopoly power in your industry so that is very interesting going forward because that means because the Supreme Court creates precedent that the next time the NCAA finds itself in court it now cannot use the all of these different defenses it has to argue with the understanding that they have monopoly power in their industry and because of the sherman act there's now all kinds of lanes that are open to to different institutions or athletes or whoever might want to sue the ncaa uh, because the supreme court has basically said yeah the ncaa has monopoly power now it is possible i believe for the ncaa to successfully convince a court that if it makes certain changes now it's no longer a monopoly power uh, I, i'm not exactly sure how that whole process works but the reality is is this is not this is not the end of all this also uh one of the kind of procedural things that was talked about during the oral arguments was this idea of a rule of reason analysis so that's part of when you're litigating anything that has to do with the sherman act that's part of what you do is you do this analysis, the rule of reason. And the NCAA basically said, no, do a quick look analysis, which means you don't have to do an extensive fact-based investigation into everything the NCAA does and how they operate. The NCAA said, we're clearly not a monopoly power. Uh, and also, we're not even a business. The <laughs> NCAA, that's basically what they argued. They said, we're not, e we're not even our own business. We're just this conglomerate of other businesses. So, or not, not even businesses. We're this conglomerate of, of public and private institutions. So just use the quick look analysis and tell us that we're not in violation of the Sherman Act. So the Supreme Court said, no, this, the rule of reason analysis is appropriate for the same reason that I just gave about saying that the NCAA does have monopoly power in their industry, no matter how you define it. So that is very important because the Supreme Court said that now if the NCAA is once again brought up on any anything having to do with violation of the Sherman Act, the NCAA now courts will be far more likely to use that rule of reason analysis, which judging by the NCAA's insistence that it not be used is probably not good for the NCAA that when you use the rule of reason the burden of proof is on the defendant so the NCAA has to prove that it is not in violation of any of the uh, any of the statutes under the Sherman Act whereas if you do a quick look then it's actually the burden of proof is on uh, is on the uh, the you know whoever's suing them uh, to prove that the NCAA is somehow in violation of one of the statutes under the Sherman Act, and, and that is much more difficult to prove, uh, especially in the U.S. legal system, as most of you probably know. So all of that is the good news to come out of this decision, and it's a very well-written opinion by Justice Gorsuch. Um, a little bit of legalese, of course, but also a very interesting cross-section into the history of college sports. He goes all the way back to what is considered the very first collegiate sporting event back in the 19th century, a... Uh, a, a uh, rowing, uh, a rowing regatta between Yale and Harvard, uh, and so he goes back there and kind of tracks sports, uh, collegiate sports as they go, and the formation of the NCAA. It's really interesting stuff. You can look it up and read it right now. Uh, very, very interesting from Justice Gorsuch. Uh, but there is potential negatives here that I'm noticing. So, as you remember, back in uh, back in our video talking about the oral arguments. 
all nine justices were extremely, extremely aware of how much of an effect this case could have on the broader issue of college sports. They knew exactly what they could be doing to the prospect of college sports in the future, and they really didn't want to be doing anything. Almost every justice that I can remember went, uh, actually proactively said, we do not want to mess up college sports. We don't want to completely shift the foundations of collegiate athletics right here, right now. And so coming into this decision, they knew that that's what was going on. So if you, if you're familiar with crowdfunding, then you have those stretch goals, right? Those are, those, are, those are nice to have. So one of the stretch goals here for Alston was to get the Supreme Court to affirmatively say the NCAA is not allowed to uh, bar its athletes from getting paid. They have monopoly power, therefore their athletes can't go anywhere else to play collegiate sports. Therefore, if their athletes want to be paid and the schools want to provide a salary, they want to pay them, then the athletes must be paid. So that was something that was on the table here for uh, for the Supreme Court to decide on. And right off the bat, they said, nope, that's not what's going to happen. You still can't pay college athletes. And there really was not much of a mention of that in in the opinion, at least. I mean, I didn't read. It's 50 pages. I didn't read the whole thing. But skimming through it, really not a mention of, uh, of that particular one. So the Supreme Court has no interest in deciding whether or not the NCAA is allowed to pay athletes. So if athletes want a salary, if we want to go down that particular route, then that will definitely have to be a decision by the NCAA itself. I highly doubt that the Supreme Court will ever decide that this is something they want to do. Uh, because this isn't, and it's not even something like, well, maybe if we see uh, a majority of of liberals or a majority of conservatives on the Supreme Court that then maybe they'll change their mind. It certainly didn't seem like that. There was not a single justice. If you go from Justice Kagan, who's widely regarded as the most liberal justice on the court, or Justice Sotomayor, to uh, Justice Thomas, probably the most conservative justice on the court, none of them wanted to change college athletes, uh, college athletics. So that is not going to happen, at, le at least from, uh, from a judicial standpoint. Uh, if athletes want salaries, the NCAA is going to have to change that rule itself. However, the court was not very specific about how the NCAA is to regulate these academic payments. So presumably, if a school were to, say, uh, give a student, let's say, a, a vocational scholarship over the summer, like the school, the, the, the student said that they wanted to, to take uh, to go to the local community college. Uh, for, I don't know, a welding class or something like that. Uh, the school can now provide that scholarship, which would, which it was not allowed to do in the past, if they did that under false pretenses uh, just to, you know, give a kickback to the athlete, essentially as a cash payment. Uh, I believe that would be fraud. So I don't think that they're allowed to do that. But there is still some gray area when it comes to these kinds of academic payments. Part of what is allowed is uh, is paid internships and tutoring and things like that. And as we know, I mean, for those of you who've been following college athletics for a while, you'll remember that case with uh, the University of North Carolina a few uh, years ago, where the African American studies professor was basically just handing out A's to athletes in his classes and allowing them to meet the mark for grades, even though they weren't doing well in classes that were actually grading them on a fair scale so we know that sometimes schools athletic departments professors will take matters into their own hands with these kinds of things and so if a professor wants a paid internship for an athlete and that paid internship just so happens to only entail one hour of work a week how, you know how do you regulate that the school is not the, the school is very willing to look the other way on that as we know uh, the athletic department is willing to look the other way, and the NCAA either doesn't care or doesn't have the capacity to actually investigate something like that. So it seems to me that there's a lot of loopholes that could potentially be exploited here. Now, if you have read the opinion closer than I have, and the Supreme Court actually makes mention of this that I didn't notice, then, then please go down in the comments and let me know. But as far as I saw... Uh, the Supreme Court basically said, yep, I mean, look, we're telling you that you're not allowed to restrict these kinds of payments, but however it is you want to deal with it, you deal with that. 
Uh, so I do see some potential issues in that regard because I really think that when it comes to giving athletes salaries, that's probably the worst way to go when it comes to actually paying athletes. There's so many issues with with that particular thing. And the problem is, if that's going to be the case, what happens if a school like, let's say, let's say, uh, I'm trying to think of a, I'm trying to think of a school that's great at football, but not a whole lot else. Um, let's say Clemson. Um, Clemson wants, gives all 50 of its incoming football recruits uh, paid internships. Now, let's say that Clemson has a, an incoming class of, of female track recruits and none of them get a paid internship. Is that a Title IX issue? You know, I mean, again, the, the football team makes a lot more money for Clemson than, than its uh, women's tennis team. And so if the football players are getting all of these so-called academic awards and its women's, women's tennis team is not... Uh, that seems to me to be an issue. It's, it would probably be a Title IX issue, although I'm not sure where Title IX stands on this particular thing because, again, that hasn't been legislated. It hasn't been litigated. So how would Title IX deal with this if it turns out that more male athletes get these sorts of paid internships and academic rewards than female athletes do? Uh, I wonder if that starts to become a problem. So that might be an issue that the NCAA has to contend with. Um, and then, you know, what happens uh, What happens if you start giving grants? You know, athletes that go into things like graduate transfers, that they're going to grad school, uh, that they can get scholarship for. Uh, what happens if they get grants? You know, I mean, it's, it's hard to track these kinds of grant money, especially... It's one thing if you're tracking five hundred thousand dollars of grant money, but if you're if you're talking twenty thousand dollars in grants provided by some booster, uh, it's kind of hard to track that. And again, the school doesn't care because if it's a you know if you're talking about a major grad transfer in football or basketball, that's big money potentially to your school given how much money is on the table. Which, by the way, the Supreme Court is very very aware of that there is so much money in college sports right now. So the Supreme Court knows the state here they knew what they were doing what they didn't want to do was be responsible for changing the face of college athletics and the reason why is because the supreme court historically is very very reticent to ever try and completely uh destroy or or fundamentally change something that that is ingrained in american life because the supreme court cannot legislate so they've always felt like if we're going to change something ultimately the burden will not be on us to actually figure out how this change uh, proceeds really the burden is on either states or the private institutions or the federal uh, legislature to actually legislate this and figure out how this works the supreme court has always been hesitant to change big things like this for that reason. And that is even more the case uh, since uh, Justice Roberts uh, became the Chief Justice of the court. And he is even more hesitant to do things like that. So this is an instance where the Supreme Court clearly knows that the solution that they have proposed here, or that not proposed, the solution that is now going to be in effect, the Supreme Court is the highest court in the land, so the solution that is now going to be in effect is not a perfect one. The Supreme Court knows that full well, but they don't want to change college athletics, and they didn't have the power in this particular situation. They'd be far overstepping their bond, their, their bounds, going far into that judicial activism uh, role if they were to use this opportunity to start ruling on name, image, and likeness uh, legislation that we've been seeing happen around the country that the NCAA is now talking about. So they couldn't do that. So this is what we get. However, I think the NCAA at this point, they know that th what, what has been what they've been doing for the last four, five, six decades, it's not going to work anymore. So I think that this decision could potentially lead the NCAA to start much more seriously looking at name, image, and likeness rules. They've already started doing it. Of course, California passed a bill recently in their state legislature that would allow athletes to collect on their name, image, and likeness rights. That kind of forced the NCAA's hand because the NCAA threatened them that they would kick California schools out of the NCAA if they were to go through with that legislation. So it's still a couple years before that bill takes effect. So the NCAA still has time 
to litigate this, to, to, to try and figure this out. Uh, but it certainly seems to me that the NCAA at this point would find name, image, and likeness legislation for, on their end much more preferable to what we're seeing here with, with potential academic payments being made to athletes or going back through the courts, bringing this back to a Supreme Court that is clearly sort of hostile to the NCAA's current business plan. Or I think the absolute worst thing for them is for to, to potentially see this being legislated at the federal level. I think the last thing the NCAA would ever want is for the U.S. House or the U.S. Senate to start dealing with this issue. Uh, I think the NCAA would not want that because they have no say in that. They have lobbying power, but there's not a lot of congressmen that seem to be on the NCAA's side in this. So I think the NCAA at this point, they're starting they're starting to feel, uh, they're starting to get their feet in the fire right now. They're starting to feel that heat a little bit. Uh, and so I think that this decision could be a jumping off point for the NCAA to really say uh, it is time for us to figure out how we're going to do name, image, and likeness so that we can avoid all of these other outcomes. And in, in my opinion, I think name, image, and likeness, that is the way to go for the future of college sports. I really do. I think uh, the idea of unshackling academic payments like the Supreme Court just did, uh, I told you all the issues that I have with that. I think it could potentially be uh, a serious problem. I think giving athletes salaries is an entire can of worms that I do not even want to think about. I don't want to think about the Title IX implications, the uh, the labor law implications. I don't want to think about the implications of, of turning college sports basically into a profession. Uh, all of that is a real issue for me. So I, I don't like going down that road. I think the best way to do this is to allow athletes to collect on their name, image, and likeness. So allow them to collect sponsorships. Uh, if you're familiar with sports like track and field, every professional track and field athlete has a sponsorship. Tennis as well. They have, they, they have all their gear sponsored and all this. That's how they make money. Uh, so, you know, you can make a little bit of money in college. I think that would be great. Uh, I've always liked the idea of, you know, having the collegiate swimmer getting a hundred bucks a week or something to go and, uh, and teach a swimming class or something like that, get paid by a rec center in the local area to go teach a swimming class. I really like that idea because again, I really think that if you do excel at, collegiate sports if you excel at anything you should be rewarded and I think and you should be allowed to collect on your labor collect on what you do it's one thing to get a scholarship there's something in it for the school to give you a scholarship there's something in it for you and there's something in it for the school uh, and so I think uh, to remove your ability to make money off of yourself uh, to me, I just, I, I don't like it. I think you should be able to make money off of yourself and the school, uh, it's not like they're losing anything by allowing you to do that. I mean, you still have to go to practice. You still have to do all these things. So they're not losing anything. It just makes your time a little bit more worthwhile. The fact that the school is not allowing you to get the level of education that a non-student athlete would be able to get. I mean, my time in college talking to the number of student athletes that I spoke to, uh, yeah, my level of education was completely different than theirs in terms of the time commitment needed from them versus from me. So to me, that is the most fair way to do it. And I really hope that this is an indication for the NCAA that no matter where they get sued, no matter what level it is, whether it's the district court, whether it's the appellate court, or now even the Supreme Court, no matter what happens or where, these courts are not friendly to the NCAA right now. Legislatures are not friendly to the NCAA. The courts are not friendly to the NCAA. The public is not friendly to the NCAA. I think the NCAA has a real problem on their hands right now. So hopefully this really forces them to look at this and say, if we want to continue, what we, if we want to continue to be the governing body of collegiate sports, we have to figure this out. Because knowing that the NCAA's feet are to the fire right now, it, if the Power Five conferences want to split off and create their own athletic association, like people have discussed in the past, I mean, this is going back a decade, people were talking about this happening, maybe longer. Right now would be the time for them to do it. The, the, the popularity of the NCAA is at an all time low. So I think right now, Mark Emmert and everyone over there in Indianapolis is probably thinking if we want this thing to stay together, we need to figure out how to keep these schools and athletes happy. So hopefully that's the long term. 
uh, consequences of this decision from the Supreme Court. In the short term, I think we could have some pretty messy situations, but hopefully in the long term, we do get a much more sustainable plan from the NCAA for how athletes are going to get compensated and how ultimately we're going to be able to fix this issue that has been ongoing for such a long time. And in a practical sense, uh, if you don't know any athletes or are related to any student athletes or, or anything like that, in a practical sense, what we get out of it is maybe more access to the athletes that we watch, uh, the knowledge that they are able to collect money from their own accomplishments, make money off themselves, which every American should be entitled to do, every, every person in the world should be entitled to do that, and we maybe get to have a little fun, we'll get our NCAA video games back and everything like that, so... Uh, and hopefully, maybe, maybe, I mean, this is, talk about a stretch goal, maybe they'll get this figured out in time for the new NCAA football game that is due to come out at some point. So, uh, that is everything you need to know about the Supreme Court decision. If you want to talk about it, head on down to the comments. Let's talk about it. This is a very interesting case, in my opinion. Uh, so, maybe we'll do some follow-ups to figure out exactly what's going on with this. But this has been a great time. So, again, comment if you want to talk about anything that has to do with this, if you have a different idea for what should happen with athletes, or if you don't think athletes should be entitled to any kind of payment. Uh, I've heard lots of people argue that as well. So, we can talk about it in the comments. But for right now, thank you so much for making it through this. We'll see you next time. We appreciate you.